Welcome to Broadband Action, a podcast presented by the Community Broadband Action Network. I'm Curtis Dean. We have a little different type of episode today. Uh, no guests, no interviews. Instead, I'm just going to be talking about my experience at the Broadband Community uh, uh, Summit West, which happened in San Diego, California, here on last week of October. We're in November now and had a little bit of time to think about my experience and kind of collect my thoughts. So I wanted to share those with the C-band community and all of those of you who listen to Broadband Action. Now, the BBC Summit West is a uh, first time event of its kind for broadband communities. Broadband communities has been putting on events for a very long time and their parent company Terrapin is uh, really kind of an expert at this as they operate events all over the world. Um, the uh, broadband communities uh, primary summit every summer is always a big hit and it's huge. Now the BBC Summit West was designed to bring some of the programming, some of the networking, some of the content uh, to folks on the West Coast uh, and so that they didn't have to travel to Nashville or some other central location like uh, Texas, where a lot of times the BBC events are, in order to get that content. So they formulated the BBC Summit West, and it was in San Diego at the San Diego Convention Center. It's my first time really spending any time in San Diego itself. Uh, the, the Convention Center itself is right by a place called the Gas Lamp District. And it is really cool. I got to tell you, I stayed at the Hard Rock Hotel, which was just like a five minute walk to the convention center. Uh, and it's right on the uh, main entrance to that gas lamp district. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, enjoyed walking around, hitting up some of the restaurants and other establishments there. Um, had a great time. Uh, the weather, ironically, was somewhat weird because when I left Iowa, it was 85 degrees and I got to San Diego and it was 68 degrees. So just a little bit of a change of pace and uh, temperature um, since then, of course, colder weather back in Iowa where I am based. And I'm sure San Diego's weather will be much nicer the rest of this winter. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the sessions uh, that I uh, either participated in or attended. A lot of great content. And I think the sessions and the programming in those sessions was top notch at BBC Summit West. But before I get to that, I want to give a huge thank you to Imon Communications. Imon Communications is a C-band provider member and they sponsored my travel to the BBC Summit West this year. I couldn't have done it without them as their support allowed us to C-Band to stretch its meager nonprofit dollars to send me out to BBC Summit West and network with lots of great people's, uh, people, grow the organization and spread the word about what we're trying to do at C-Band. Uh, so I want to thank you to the entire team at Imon Communications for being our travel sponsor this time around. Imon Communications is uh, based in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, but they also have services in several other communities in the state of Iowa, and they are growing into other markets, uh, and they're growing the right way. They're doing it organically. They're doing it with amazing customer service and a strong community focus. They're exactly the kind of company that we love to see as a C-band provider member. So hats off to Imon Communications. Uh, visit them on the web, learn more about them, and uh, to, to Corey and all the team there, thank you for being our travel sponsor. Now on to our uh, panels and other things that uh, we were either, I either participated in or uh, attended. First, what I want to cover is a panel that I did participate in. I was asked to be on a panel uh, on a topic of the innovations revolution, revolutionizing network deployment. And uh, it was an interesting panel and I learned a lot. I don't know that I contributed as much as the other uh, the other people on the panel, but uh, uh, certainly it was a great environment and a well-attended session. Uh, Frank DeJoy with Boston Omaha uh, Broadband, he was the uh, guy who led it. Uh, he was our moderator. One of the people I was on that panel with was a gentleman from a company called WeLink. And WeLink is an internet service provider. They're based in Utah, but also have markets in California. And I shared that session with him on the stage one of the interesting things they found about WeLink, and one of the reasons I wanted to highlight them is they're using fixed wireless technology in denser urban environments that are still able to de deliver multi-gigabit services. That's right, multi-gigabit services. They're using 
a uh, forms of a millimeter wave, 60 to 70 gigahertz millimeter wave to deliver that service. The technology they're deploying right now is from a company called Ketson Networks. And it's quite fascinating to look at. Uh, basically, uh, there was a great write-up in uh, TechCrunch uh, a couple of years ago, but it's still, I think, very apropos, even though the article is three years old. And I'll read a quote from that from that TechCrunch uh, article. WeLink's technology uses a mesh architecture, which means that signals can be bounced between different base stations as necessary throughout a neighborhood in order to reach a point of presence station with a fiber connection. For the typical single family home installation, a small base station, about four by four inch or inches in uh, size, is installed on a roof similar to a satellite dish, and a single cable is run down to connect to the home's router or Wi Fi station. A really cool uh, thing about that solution, as, uh, as that quote indicates, is they do need fiber. You always need fiber somewhere in a broadband network, whether it's wireless or wired or copper or glass. You got to have fiber somewhere because that's how you haul the big chunks of data. But what they do is they terminate that fiber, say at a person's home that serves then as a hub and that home unit then talks to other homes through line of sight because millimeter wave can't burn through trees, certainly can't go through buildings. And then they build out that mesh from there. Uh, quite an interesting uh, idea. And certainly mesh networks are nothing new but the approach they're taking with the uh, millimeter wave is kind of interesting and uh, to me would make a lot of sense in denser environments. Um, as uh, they mentioned in their presentation, WeLink uh, representative mentioned, it, this is not for a rural deployment. And we all know that rural areas are often the last to get broadband. We still have a lot of unserved and underserved people out there that could benefit for multi-gig services, but this is not the solution. There are other solutions for that. Uh, Tirana has made a uh, big, big presence in the space on uh, companies like Open Broadband in North Carolina, C-band provider, and many, many others that are deploying it for uh, uh, higher bandwidth services um, over greater distances, you know, two to four miles. Um, this isn't gonna go two to four miles, it's gonna go a block or two. But if you build enough of these units and they mesh together and they can talk to each other and see each other, you can build a pretty darn robust network. Um, and so it's really cool that that solution is happening. Now, this is a solution, like I mentioned, for urban environments. And it is a solution that is not going to solve for necessarily unserved, but it is going to provide another alternative to people who maybe already have a broadband choice from a cable network or a, a DSL. They're looking for something different. They're looking for something better. And these guys are doing two gig by two gig. So that's right, sur symmetrical over this fixed wireless technology. And they're pricing it at a reasonable price. In fact, they're partnering with uh, Los Angeles County, uh, which has its own kind of um, initiative to help uh, fill broadband gaps in LA County. Um, and they're working with them and they're going to be able to offer uh, a, low a lower cost service using their uh, fixed wireless services in parts of LA County that need it because of the income and the demographics there. And so we link is stepped up to the plate and they're gonna be working on that so they can provide these services at a, quite a low cost. So it's much more affordable than other people. So really stood out the conversation I have with them and I'm hoping to get we link on for a uh, uh, discussion later on here on Broadband Action or on our sister podcast member spotlight somewhere down the line. Now, I mentioned things that are going on in Los Angeles. There were a lot of people from L.A. there because, of course, it was in San Diego. So they were able to get there without traveling across the country, maybe even driving down. Um, and uh, a lot of action there and a lot of discussion among nonprofit organizations who are doing things to fill broadband gaps in ways that the industry isn't able to do either for economics or just no desire. Uh, one of them is an organization call, uh, called C Churla, C-H-I-R-L-A. They are based in Los Angeles. And I sat down and had a great conversation with Gabriel DeWitt. Uh, he's their leader there. And this is a nonprofit that is uh, basically trying to provide services to the immigrant population in and around L.A. They have a center. They, they have a building now. They're getting a new building that they're going to locate to. And that new building is going to have um, uh, living spaces for people, especially temporary housing. It's going to have um, 
uh, learning centers for persons uh, who maybe don't speak the language but need access to learning, whether it be daily living learning or digital skills, a huge part of what they want to do. Um, and of course, they're also trying to fill broadband gaps. One of the interesting things for them is, uh, like uh, others are trying to do, they're trying to fill those broadband gaps in an affordable way. Building fiber in a dense urban environment like Los Angeles is really, really hard and it's really, really expensive. And the people that they serve, their nonprofit serves, are people who probably will never be able to afford a $60 or $70 a month internet, at least not when they're just getting established in the community. So what Chirla is going to do is they are going, the planning on anyway, is bringing fiber to their new facility that they're uh, getting ready to renovate. And then they're going to use that as a hub to get services into the homes of immigrant population that live close to them, or at least somewhere in that those neighborhoods that they serve. Um, they're looking at fixed wireless technology likely to do that. Right now, their challenge is, how do we get fiber to our building? Because we need that fiber. That's going to have to be what we use to get, turn up the circuit to be able to serve more people. So um, we had a great conversation with uh, Gabriel. I gave him some ideas about um, you know some of our C-band partners that he might reach out to that might be able to help him uh, figure out how to get that fiber to his location. But uh, they're doing great work there, and it was really neat to uh, to meet up with them and learn more about what, what they were doing. Again, hope to have Gabriel on at some point down the line and uh, talk more about what they're doing at Churla and uh, see if it could be a model for other areas where there is an unserved uh, population who maybe are lacking the affordability, uh, being able to afford the broadband that is available, and uh, how maybe nonprofits can be motivated to and funded course, to be able to provide broadband for those people, fill the gaps and help those folks live their lives. So really great conversation with Gabriel. Another session at BBC Summit West I really enjoyed was uh, called Research and Educational Networks and Their Role in Broadband Equity. And uh, the speaker uh, was Kim Lewis. She is the Vice President of Government Relations at Scenic. And Scenic is the Research and Educational Network, or REN, in California. And she talked about how RENs like Scenic, like Merit Network in Michigan, and others all over the nation uh, have provided high-speed uh, broadband connections to research institutions uh, and other educational facilities for many, many years. And now how they're growing that mission to help fill the role during um, beginning with COVID and beyond uh, to help with digital equity efforts, uh, including bringing uh, people online that weren't available before. They spun off a, uh, a new uh, uh, subsidiary, Brightscape as it's called, or I'm sorry, Brightscope, and it is focusing on last mile solutions and trying to interconnect or connect the underserved communities with each other. Uh, really good talk about there, and she talked about how they're leveraging their experience as a research institution and network uh, to help solve for middle mile and, as I mentioned, last mile solutions in uh, California. Um, they talked about the challenges. She talked about the challenges of uh, filling that digital divide on all levels with equity, access, uh, deployment, uh, affordability, et cetera. So it was really good. It gave me an insight, insight into uh, what the RENs are doing. I'm very familiar with the uh, Merit Network in Michigan. Uh, first time I'd ever really connected with any of the other RENs. Uh, Kim showed me a map when I talked to her the other day about uh, all the wrens across the country. And again, another topic that uh, I'm hoping to catch her later on and get her on broadband action to dig a little more deeply into the topic. A popular speaker at broadband events all over the nation, uh, and in particular, the Western part of the US is a conversation that was uh, engaged in with Brandy Ryder. And uh, Brandy is the executive director of the broadband office in Colorado. And uh, she's seen as one of the real bright spots uh, among all the broadband offices nationwide. Uh, she's been involved in uh, trying to help connect all of the uh, unserved locations in Colorado now for quite a long time. Uh, in fact, a, the governor of Colorado, uh, Jared Polis, has uh, laid down uh, the, the gauntlet that 99% of all unserved and underserved locations will have broadband by 2027. Pretty strong mandate. But they've used already $55 million in uh, funding from the pandemic funds that came from the federal government. 
along with uh, additional money from the state and the capital uh, projects fund from the federal government. Uh, and now with $826 million in uh, the bank or coming to them soon from the BEAD program, they hope to really close that gap. Another thing they are trying to do is to close the affordability gap. Um, some 44% of the people who don't connect to broadband in Colorado say they do that because of the cost. And so they're working for ways to do that, even though ACP has sunset. So, uh, Brandy, very interesting speaker as always, and uh, she shared a lot of the perspectives of uh, the mile high state, so to speak, in Colorado and all the great efforts that they're making. I mentioned Los Angeles County uh, before when I was talking about uh, WeLink, and they were also uh, their uh, broadband uh, director, uh, Eric Sasaki, was on uh, the conference at the conference on a panel, and he talked about the challenges that LA County, uh, Los Angeles County, has had connecting. LA County itself, if it were a country, is the eleventh would be the eleventh largest country in the world. Crazy when you think about that. Uh, what eleven point one million people? I think they said. Uh, and actually, they'd be the eleventh largest state, not eleventh largest country in the world. Let me correct myself on that. But they are huge, and um, and in that county, because of the size, three hundred twenty-five thousand people or households rather don't have home internet. Big gap. And I mentioned some of the things they're trying to do to um, uh, cover that gap. That we're mentioning they are working with WeLink, but they're doing many other things there too, um, and. Another thing they're they're uh, focusing on is really public-private partnerships. LA County is not going to build a municipally or county-owned fiber utility, but they really are doing a lot to reach out to the private sector and uh, get them involved, uh, get them boots on the ground um, so that they can fill these gaps that are left. And hopefully, as I mentioned before, um, fill that affordability gap because that's a huge one. One more thing I wanted to mention, and this goes back to the panel that I got to sit on about technology innovations. Uh, I should have addressed it in that part of the podcast, but hey, these are how things go, right? Um, and that was, um, there was a gentleman there, uh, Randy Pierce. He's with Google Fiber or G Fiber, as I like to call themselves, uh, and kind of part of their West Coast operations. And he talked about one of the innovations that they've been using that I quite frankly have been a little bit cautious about, and that is micro trenching. Um, Google Fiber, G Fiber has used micro trenching. Um, they are convinced it is a, a, a good method to save cost on fiber installation. If you're not familiar with micro trenching and what it is, maybe we'll do a podcast about it at some point, but it's really basically um, utilizing uh, streets and the rights of way and uh, uh, Micro trenching means they basically take a, a concrete saw, they saw a slot in the concrete, they put the fiber in that, and then they put a uh, some sort of covering over it, epoxy or whatever to keep it in place. And it really can uh, speed up deployment uh, times and it really can reduce deployment costs. I've been skeptical about it because it just sounds a little iffy. And if I were to wear a city manager or a public works director hat, I'd be a little concerned about people sawing lines in my concrete, putting things in there. And what would that mean if I need to come into a street project or a, a patching project down the line, whether it's ripping up the whole street or just replace, replacing a piece of that street? What does that mean and impact my ability to do that as a public works director, street manager, et cetera? Well, um, Randy's trying to demystify that. And he did a really good job of explaining how the early days micro trenching, there were some cowboys out there. Uh, it was a little bit of the wild, wild west. And uh, some of the methods weren't always uh, solid and the construction methods weren't really good. Um, he said that there's a lot of development going on in that area and that he at Google Fiber and others are trying to prove that micro trenching can be done well, it can be done responsibility responsibly, it can be done reliably, and it can result in high quality networks without all of the uh, deeper trenching and boring that is needed to build a network in an urban area. Doesn't really do you any good in our rural areas that need broadband. Um, that's not really a good use, app, uh, use case for it, but uh, in places like 
Orange County, where he mentioned they're doing micro trenching for their Google Fiber deployment, where it's a very dense urban environment and a lot, a lot of underground facilities in the rights of way. Um, it's making a difference and allowing them to make a project uh, cost out. So that's that's another interesting takeaway uh, from last week's BBC Summit West was maybe micro trenching. Maybe I need to take another look at it. What do I know? Right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, kind of wrapping up a summary of the BBC Summit West in San Diego that I really enjoyed being at. A lot of great contacts there. Uh, hopefully a lot of people you'll be hearing about here on Broadband Action uh, in the future as we lend their expertise to our community. Again, I want to extend my big thank you to Imon Communications, a C-band uh, provider member, uh, and they were the travel sponsor that helped uh, offset the cost to go to San Diego and participate in the event. Uh, Imon Communications doing a great job wherever they go and providing very high quality service and being a great community partner. So thanks for being a CBAN member. Thanks for being our travel partner, Imon. Uh, and uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Imon, got their link on the screen. And if you're listening, I'll put it in the description below so you can uh, check them out. Good people there. That's it for this week's edition of Broadband Action. Thanks for tuning in, watching, or listening. We hope to see you back next time. I'm Curtis Dean. Thanks.